You know, when you make a mistake, like, I own it the wrong shoes. Or, <laughs> you know, you, you make a right turn and you fucking, uh, you know, you, you get back on. That's a fucking mistake, you know. Today is 9 nine nineteen. This is a really weird date for me. Nine nine eighty nine was the day I got married. 30 fucking years ago. Whoa. Today. Today. So for the last week, I have really been thinking about this, like where I was as a human being then and where I was as a human being today because now I could gauge it through that marriage and what my thought process was. And it's so weird that that was the second biggest mistake of my life. She was a great girl, and we weren't supposed to be married. Uh, I dated her for four years before we got married, and it was just... Uh, the whole four years, like the whole four years, I was trying to, you know, prepare this podcast and write a little bit last night, and I was just thinking about, it was just a crazy, I mean, we were together for four years, and we lived in five different states in four years. So, like, did you think, like, a year in, like, yeah, we're having fun, but I won't marry her? I was 22 years old. No? Okay. okay. I wasn't even thinking about fucking marriage. I was 22 years old. When you're 22 years old, you shouldn't be thinking about marriage. You're having fun with a girl. You're going away for on weekends. Everybody works. Everybody's got energy to do shit. <clears throat> you're basically fucking. You're in love. You're young. Nobody's talking about marriage. You know, if somebody talks about it, you shut it down. And I, I was too busy. I was doing drugs. I was doing crimes. She was just my Bonnie and Clyde, whatever. We were just a Bonnie and Clyde team. And I was with her for a long time. And the, the, the reason why I want to talk about this is important because when you marry somebody, it's a fucking big, 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 big decision. You know, I was speaking to a friend of mine two weeks ago, a very dear, dear friend. I've known him since grammar school, and it was one of the saddest calls I ever had because he told me he's 60 years old and he's alone. He doesn't know what he did on this planet to be alone. He had been, been married five times. Whoa. The la he got married two times in one year. He married one chick and it lasted six months. The last chick she married, are you ready for this one? I mean, I love him to dearly and uh, he's family and stuff, but I had to laugh. She told him that she was going home to visit her father. They got married, and they were together like two weeks, and she told him she was going home to visit her father, and then he got a divorce thing in the mail. You know, he's, he's, so now you're 60 and you're alone. You know what? Nobody wants to die alone. When you're 20, you're like, I don't give a fuck. I don't need no bitch. I don't need no man. I'll, I'll die like Charles Bronson in a bunker. No, listen, nobody wants to die alone, man. And it's so weird that I started, before I started dating this girl, I had been on a, and I'm not ashamed to say it, I had been celibate for eight months and without a, a girlfriend for a year. Like, I was on a really bad cold streak in my life. I was getting my life together. I, well, part of uh, those, uh, part of that year, I was four months, I was homeless. So it's tough to get pussy when you're homeless, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, it was one of those years I was just having a bad year, and and it was funny. I hadn't touched a woman for like eight months, and in three days, I was in three women when I got to Boulder. Whoa. Like, it was that fast. I met a girl on the plane. The next day, I went to get an apartment. I met a girl on the hill that I ended up fooling around with, and then I met some other girl, and we dated for like two nights, and I never saw her again. She lived on the other side of town. It was like when you don't need it, it's it's there. It was just a weird, a weird time in my life. So I was just enjoying bold. I was just living bolder. But back to the case here. Uh, when I met her, you know, we, we just dated. And then I went, we almost broke up right before I went to prison. I got locked up November 18th when I got charged. That was the day I kidnapped that dude. Like November 5th, she had a hair thing. She was cutting hair, and she had like a competition, and she wanted me to go. And I didn't go. I just didn't want to go. It was like, like a mile away. It was like an hour away, and I didn't want to go. 
And that really hurt her feelings. And that left us in limbo. We were in limbo for about two weeks. And I had seen her once or twice, but the relationship wasn't on good terms. And all of a sudden, I got arrested. So all of a sudden, she stayed loyal and she stuck it out with me, you know. We worked together on getting all the paperwork done, everything that was due, and, you know, she helped me get my GED. She drove me to this place. I mean, it was just crazy after the... So that made us a little tighter, you know, and then I got sentenced, and she didn't turn her back on me then. And while... It's funny because while I was in prison, you know... For four years, I was with her every day. And then I get locked up. And now I'm not with her. And I got to be honest with you. It wasn't like I was missing her during the week. And when she'd come to see me on Sundays, I was more concerned with what she brought me than seeing her. Like, it was just really weird. So I thought when I got out that we would, to be honest with you, to be strictly honest with you, because I was such a loser, my mental phase is when I got out, I'd fuck up and we'd break up. Like, I didn't want to break up with her, especially after she was so nice to me and stuck it out with me in prison and stuff. But I knew that the electricity wasn't there. Like, it's not like I was writing her love letters every fucking day from prison. I wrote her a letter from time to time, and I'm being as honest as I can here. But we were too, and this has happened to a lot of the people listening to this podcast. At this point, you're too far involved. And something inside of you doesn't want to say stop. Like, hey, stop. We shouldn't be together. But it was weird. While I was in, in prison, she would come on Mondays, and I would tell her not to wear underwear and shit like that. And we would have sex. We would eat something. And between you and me, guys, I couldn't wait for her to get up and leave. That's not good. No, and it was it was fucking with me. I just thought it was maybe something I was going through because I was locked up. And then, boom, I get out. And again, she's my world, and we're hanging out. And she was a beautiful girl, guys. And she had a great family who adopted me as part of their family. And they really came through for me when the fucking... When I got locked up, that's when they really showed their true colors. I mean, I always had my doubts that they even liked me. When I got locked up, the mother and dad bent over backwards for me. So in my mind, I had a debt to pay them. And the debt was to come out of prison and be a fucking good guy. Like their dad, my ex-wife's dad and mom for that case were good fucking white people out of Buffalo. I mean, solid fucking Polish people out of Buffalo. Solid. I mean, I think about them. There's not a week that goes by that I don't think about him or her in some way. They had become my parents. I was really tight with her. And after I got locked up, after the, the first time I went to county, and it was her father who bailed me out. It was my girlfriend's father who bailed me out. And then we became tight. We became like father and son. I would go up there every Saturday and cut uh, firewood with him. And we'd fucking bail hay and fucking shovel snow and kill snakes. You know, this was endless. Before I got locked up, I was very tight with him. So now I went to prison. He's sitting there with me in prison. When I, when I was looking to get out... The judge was going to, uh, community corrections had ruled me out. They voted not to have me in community corrections. What that means is they didn't want me to be like Jeffrey Epstein. They didn't want me to go to work every day, like have a work release program. He fucking wrote a letter and, and paid my attorney to do a special hearing to go in front of the community corrections board to accept me into a halfway house. I mean, so these are all the little things they did for me. So in the back of my mind, I was indebted to their family in a big way. And I had to pay that debt. So I put my head down. I got out of prison. I got a good job. And listen, man, it's not like I was robbing or kidnapping. All that shit was behind me. The only thing I was still fighting were my demons, were the drugs. 
And everybody knew that. Like, uh, she knew it. I don't think the parents knew it. The parents had known of my drug use, but didn't know of my drug use at the time. She knew about my drug use. And we, you know, sometimes we think it's going to get better. You, 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 ever, you ever go buy a car? And you walk in and you go, I want the car to be baby powder blue. And the guy goes, I don't have it in blue. I have it in fucking uh, canary yellow. And you're like, well, I really don't like that color. But the guy says to you, what if I lowered the price $600? Would you like the color better? And you're like, yeah, if you lowered it for 600 I would. And you take the car. You take the car. You drive the car. You're happy with the car. But at the end of the day, it's not the car you wanted. Yeah, you save six hundred, and you, you know you went out to dinner with three, and you put three in the bank. But it's not really the car you wanted. That's I want you to think about that. It's not the car you wanted. We do this in life sometimes. We go along with something. It's not really what I wanted, but let me go along with it. You know, when you serve an apprenticeship, nobody wants to serve a fucking apprenticeship. Nobody wants to do four fucking years digging wires and shit to to fucking uh, for eight bucks an hour to get spy, bit by spiders and snakes and shit like that. But you know, at the end of the four years, you're gonna have a career. You know, the, that's why if you get into one of those careers, you want to make sure you love all this shit. But what I'm trying to say is this: that I was indebted to their family. So when I got out, I tried my hardest. The only problem I had was my addiction. I thought that in time, like buying a car and saving 600, I thought that in time, I would get used to the car. You know what I'm saying? And we all do that. We all do this at one point in our lives and we learn a valuable lesson. I didn't do it with a car. I did it with a human being. What bothers me the most about this 30 years and looking back was that I did something that I didn't want to do that I was raised not to do, which is to tell people what you feel. And if you don't want to do something, don't do it. You know, I got caught in the fog that I, if I would have sat her down like a man and said, listen, I love you. But I'm not crazy gaga over you. Like, I'm not, I don't know. It was, I think it was too soon after my mom's death. Something was not right for my feelings towards her.